Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm going to try to utilize this the best I can. If I am too quiet, please let me know. Um, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. So um, my name is Megan Ebers. Uh, like Nicoletta said, I'm a postdoc um, in applied math here at UW. And today I want to talk to you about mobile sensing with shallow recurrent decoder networks. And kind of the broader overview of my talk is I want to introduce the framework that I'm using um, and kind of go into the math a little bit um, to try to give some more intuition into what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then I'm going over three applications of, um, that, of really cool real world um, problems and technical challenges um, that we are trying to address with this, uh, with this architecture. So dynamic systems are found all around us and they present a really rich and complex set of challenges when we wanna monitor, predict and control whatever system of interest we're trying to study. Dynamical modeling gives us this mathematical framework to describe the world around us and how things behave and change over space and time. And it enables us to quantify these rich interactions um, between the quantities that kind of co-evolve. So how do we monitor and predict and control these complex systems? It all starts with sensing. How do we measure our, our system? So in my research, I kind of distinguish this idea of measurements into two different types of sensors, um, either immobile or mobile sensors. So a stationary or immobile sensor is kind of what it sounds like. It's fixed in a specific location and it doesn't change its position um, during its operation. So for example, the I-90 Wildlife Coalition has a lot of these infrared cameras that they'll put under bridges or over overpasses along I-90 to monitor wildlife movement, um, such as this cougar that they saw um, in the Central Cascades. It's an immobile sensor. A mobile sensor, as you can imagine, it, move, it, it moves during its operation. So for example, the Yellowstone Wolf Project attaches GPS collars to different wolves to monitor things like their population dynamics, um, predator-prey interactions, or their social behavior. However, a lot of the systems or applications that we wanna study necessitate mobile sensing. Um, so for example, there are buoys in the ocean that can help scientists understand ocean dynamics, weather patterns, uh, marine environments, um, drones can be deployed into a wildfire to figure out the hottest spots to address first or to locate missing persons. Um, and then something that I'm very passionate about is wearable tech like smartwatches that can use sensors like heart rate monitors or accelerometers to enable individuals to monitor and manage their own health or fitness, especially in real time. Additionally, these complex systems that we study can be really difficult to, to measure, especially when they're really high dimensional. Um, for example, sea surface temperature across the entire globe. You're not gonna measure the temperature at every single location throughout the entire, um, the entire ocean. That's infeasible. And a lot of times these systems don't have physics-based models that we can rely on where our underlying dynamics are not known. Further figuring out um, where to place the sensors to get the most optimal state estimation is a really difficult challenge. A lot of people who do this state estimation um, exploit kind of these uh, low rank structures or these patterns that tend to kind of emerge in these higher dimensional systems. Um, but a lot of times these state estimation paradigms don't utilize the entire time history of a sensor's measurements. It's really just utilizing the value at that location in time and in space. So what we propose is utilizing the whole time history of the sensors to encode kind of this global information of our uh, high dimensional state space. And that brings us to this idea of shallow recurrent decoder networks. And we're gonna break this down. This sounds kind of scary and enigmas, but what, allow, what we can accomplish with these shallow recurrent decoder networks, or I'm gonna call them SHRED, um, as, a, as a fun acronym, um, we're learning a mapping from this limited set of measurements to the full state space by utilizing that trajectory of the sensors, so that time history of the sensor measurements. And it's worth noting that um, SHRED was originally developed by folks here at UW specifically for immobile sensors. Um, but in my work today, I'm gonna talk about how we can extend this framework to research projects that require mobile sensing. All right, so SHRED. Like I said, the goal is to map from a sparse set 
of sensor measurement trajectories to this high dimensional um, full state space. So you can kind of see like the red, the blue, the green dots, those are where the sensors are placed and that's where they're taking measurements across these snapshots in time. This is a supervised machine learning framework. You need to have the full set of uh, information, the full data set um, in order to train this model. A lot of times you don't have access to the high dimensional data set. So you're gonna maybe have to use proxy data um, such as from simulation data. And that can be used as kind of the surrogate um, for this real world data. What we're gonna do next is use a long short-term um, memory network or an LSTM. And this processes this, the time delay embedded trajectories or our time histories of the sensor measurements. This step learns a latent or low rank representation of what's happening in time, what, what, our, sen or what our dynamics are doing temporally. Next, the feed forward neural network is gonna act as a shallow decoder that reconstructs the full high dimensional state space from the low rank representation that the LSTM learned. Um, and what we end up with is this architecture that on the surface seems really simple, like LSTMs, feed forward no neural networks, they're not necessarily innovative um, in a like current novel way. However, the data itself and how we can utilize the time histories time delay embedding these time histories um, allow us to get really um, impressive performance um, with a lot of the applications that we'll look at later. One of the things that I really want to, um, you guys to take away from this is that there are theor like mathematical theoretical underpinnings to a lot of this work. And by utilizing the theory and how we frame this, it can really, um, aid in interpretability of, of the outcomes that we're looking at. And so the theoretical underpinnings of SHRED or our shallow de recurrent decoder networks, it's based on this idea of the separation of variables techniques for linear partial differential equations. So how many of you guys have taken a differential equations class or kind of like know what partial differential equations are? Cool, great. Um, at its core, if for those of you who don't know, a differential equation is just a way for us to understand how a system changes. That's basically what it's telling us what to do. There are two really basic types of differential equations. There are ordinary and partial. There's others, but we're just gonna talk about those for a second. So an ordinary differential equation or an ODE is just a function of one independent variable, such as time alone. Versus a partial differential equation, or PDE, depends on multiple independent variables, such as time and space. So let's look at an example of a really, really simple PDE, one of the simplest that we can study. It's this heat equation. So here, our heat equation, U accounts for um, the fact that temperature is a function of both space and time. It changes um, across kind of the spatial distribution, but as it evolves over time, the, dis the temperature distribution changes. To help visualize this, this was really helpful for me to kind of break this down visually, but at our time zero, our temperature is distributed across space like this. And as time evolves, the temperature also changes across space, but as we continue to evolve in time, you kind of get this evolution or system change. What I hope that you guys notice is that each square or state, in this case, temperature, is each square is affected by its neighbor, both in space and in time. And so what you can do and exploit is that this local spatial position is coupled to its neighbors and is ultimately coupled globally because of spatial derivatives that you take when you're trying to solve a PDE. So one of the standard methods for solving PDEs, like I alluded to, especially for linear PDEs, is the separation of variables. So the separation of variables assumes that a solution to a linear PDE can be separated into a product of its independent variables. You can make it simpler, make our lives a lot easier. Um, so for example, with the heat equation, we can separate this into its time and its space functions, and then solve these as a sum of the, um, the two linear ODEs to, to find the solution to the PDE. Basically, this is a really easy way or great way to make our lives easier. 
what I want to kind of uh, present is and hypothesize is that shred is kind of like a data driven uh, separation of variables. And what I mean by that is, and we don't, we haven't proven this, but this is what we theorize is that our LSTM is learning what the, our dynamical system is doing temporally. And then Lin in, a, in a linear sense, in that you can kind of combine them in series, the shallow decoder is learning what the system is doing spatially, where it's expanding from this low rank to the full dimension in the state space. Are there any questions before we move on? Just because I, I'm really, I really want to make sure people understand kind of the, uh, the mathematical underpinnings of this first. This feels like a lecture. I'm sorry. It's not supposed to be like class. I, I think it's really, really cool. But um, now that we've kind of introduced um, the framework um, on a basic level, there's a lot that it's really interesting to go play with. Um, if you want to go use the code itself, um, it's up on GitHub, and I can show a link to it later. But there are a few different applications that we implement the shallow recurrent decoder. Um, with systems that I mentioned that just require a mobile sensing paradigm. So the three that I'm going to talk about today are this global sea surface temperature, explosion dynamics, and human motion tracking. These have nothing to do with each other except for the fact that they are complex dynamical systems and they need uh, mobile sensing. Um, and so the first two applications actually use data generated from simulations. And then this final application um, uses a variety of real world experimental data that um, people have provided in the biomechanics community as open source data sets. So we'll start with the global sea surface temperature. So this data set is provided by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This data covers 27 years of um, averaged uh, sea surface temperature taken every single week. So it's averaged over a week for 27 years. Um, and what it basically provides is a snapshot at every single um, week of 180 by 360 uh, grid points. Um, what's interesting to note about this data set is it's kind of what's considered quasi-periodic. So it kind of has this rhythmic periodic um, behavior, but it does change year to year, season to season. Um, and this was, a, I think, a really interesting data set to start with, um, especially because there is a lot um, of other previous research out there that we can kind of compare this to. So what I did is I pretended that there were shipping routes. And I, was, I said, there is going to be a shipping route on the west coast of the US. There's going to be a shipping route across the Atlantic. And there's going to be a shipping route down in Antarctica for some reason. Um, just trying to see how important the trajectories were towards reconstructing the full um, temperature fields. And so what we did is for each of these three shipping routes, as well as their kind of permutations, so the different combinations of them all together or individually, we learned a mapping using shred between the sensor measurements. And so you can actually see um, here, those are the trajectories of every single temperature, um, temperature value at the moving location of the ship. And so those are the trajectories that we're using as our limited input set to kind of learn this low rank latent space, reconstruct a high dimensional um, space, and reconstruct ultimately our temperature field um, across our data set. There were kind of two scenarios that we wanted to evaluate. So the first was kind of this interpolatory sense of um, if we know what's happening um, at certain parts of the world, can we reconstruct what's happening elsewhere versus this extrapolatory sense? So this is more of like a forecasting scenario. Can we predict what might be happening in the future? So what we did is we randomly partitioned our data across our, our whole time. So, you know, obviously doing your normal partitioning, training validation test. To provide a baseline, we used um, immobile sensors, so one and three sets of immobile sensors, um, and their time histories to train our shred model. And what I have up here is the histogram of 
our error between our ground truth and reconstructed temperatures across all of the grid points in each snapshot over time. And basically what I want you to take away from this is that the distribution is centered pretty near zero with not too heavy of tails, meaning we did a really pretty good job of reconstructing um, our temperature. An interpolation problem isn't necessarily the, the most difficult. So this is a really good toy set, uh, toy model to give us kind of some intuition whether or not this method will work on harder data sets. When we compare how well our mobile sensors did in performing this mapping, we kind of observe this comparable reconstruction error across all of our mobile sensing routes relative to our immobile, or our immobile sensor reconstructions. However, you'll notice that there are a couple um, distributions that look a little a little less um, centered, or they're, they're centered, but they, they have heavier tails. And when you dig into what that actually looks like, what pops out is really interesting. So on the top row, that's our ground truth. The bottom row is our reconstruction. And across all of our test samples, you'll kind of see it, it really nails the general structure of the temperature field. But especially around the edges, you'll see this kind of smoothing or low pass filtering. And what we've noticed is there's a lot of, um, Shred has a lot of difficulty in learning these like higher frequencies in the signals. Um, we don't quite know why yet, <laughs> but it is an interesting phenomenon that continually pops up in a lot of the, um, the data sets that we have studied. And you'll see this a little bit in the exposure dynamics as well. When we go into our um, temporally partitioned data to look at how well we can either extrapolate or forecast whatever word you want to use, um, we again um, partition our data. So we actually train on the first 60% of the snapshots. We validate on the next 20% and test on the next 20%. And I put all of this up here because um, it's a lot to look at. And I want us to kind of like look at what's going on. So you'll kind of notice the immobile sensors still do a pretty good job, um, not quite as tall. I can't, that's not a great descriptive word, but um, it does pretty okay in, in extrapolating, um, especially compared to kind of our baseline gold standard of um, our randomly partitioned immobile sensing data. And what's interesting, and there's not a ton of rhyme or reason to this that we have been able to into it, is that various individual or combinations of shipping routes give either more or, or better or worse reconstruction errors. And you would kind of think that more shipping routes means more information to, to give better training, but we actually see poorer reconstruction error with more um, more sh shipping route combinations, like on this bottom row on the right, um, versus some of the like individual ones, like the Atlantic Ocean um, in the temporally partitioned scenario actually does pretty similarly to the randomly partitioned data. So this is an active area of research of trying to understand, can we actually use arbitrary sensor trajectories or does it matter where we choose um, the sensors to go? Cool. So we'll move on to our explosion dynamics. Um, this is a really interesting problem that one of that my colleagues and I are working on recently, and it kind of involves the characteristics of the explosion, so temperature, pressure, concentration of the gas, as well as kind of the detonation waves that um, evolve out of it. And so, to do this in a controlled setting, uh, one of the PhD students generates all of this uh, simulation data. Fortunately, we are not actually setting off explosions. Um, but that allows us to, to kind of uh, measure things precisely in the simulated setting, as well as control for a lot of things like our initial conditions, the amount of detonation um, for the explosion, and then monitoring things, like I said, pressure, temperature, gas concentration. And our moonshot goal with this is to not only use a shallow rec recurrent decoder network to learn a mapping from, for example, temperature measurements, and then reconstruct the full spatial temporal field of temperature, but also can we 
at the same time reconstruct things like pressure and concentration without measuring them itself. And as you'll notice, this is a one-way process. It starts from nothing and goes, blows up into the explosion. This is a much harder problem than the sea surface temperature where it's this kind of quasi-periodic rhythmic behavior. Um, another really difficult thing about this data set is that there's a lot of parametric implications, meaning slight changes to initial conditions will completely change how the dynamics evolve over time. And before we get into some of the results, I kind of want to give some intuition as to why this matters. Imagine a natural disaster. Um, for example, I don't know if you guys remember, there was the, the train that derailed in uh, Ohio last year, and there was like a big toxic chemical explosion, right? So imagine that we could send a drone into that accident and collect some measurements about, for example, the temperature. And now we can reconstruct um, the full fields of our system characteristics and that we care about. And so, and even for example, forecast some of the downstream effects where the, the plume is going, where the, who it's gonna affect, where we need to evacuate first, that kind of thing. And this gives disaster response teams maybe more information, where to send their um, resources, decision-making, for example, for ev evacuation. Um, this would require a lot more training data rather than just like this one example, obviously. But um, this is kind of this moonshot goal of like sparse remote sensing to reconstruct all of the measurements that we care about. So this first step in this moonshot goal of multimodal reconstruction is showing that at a minimum, especially with this one-way process, can we reconstruct the full field, for example, temp temperature field um, from a limited set of measurements? And I put this up here just to show an example of um, kind of the trajectory of our sensor that's moving through the dynamics. So the snapshot itself is just one snapshot in time, but I'm overlaying the entire trajectory of the, the sensor um, across all of the across all of the uh, snapshots. And so we're actually able to reconstruct this single temperature field from a single dynamic sensor pretty well. And again, this is interpolation, not, um, we're not forecasting anything. Uh, and again, you can kind of see this smoothing or low pass filtering of, um, especially at the edges where it captures Shred is able to reconstruct most of the like salient features of our um, system behavior, but it really is um, struggles at, at certain aspects. So next along this kind of moonshot goal trajectory, we wanna see how well Shred could generalize its reconstruction across parameters. And we're doing this by um, doing a one trial holdout. Um, and then, so we train on all of them, test on the held out one. And so here you just see seven um, different simulations. This is all the same snapshot in time. The only thing that has changed is the amount of um, TNT or blast energy at the, at the beginning. And what's really interesting, and I'll have you note here, there is kind of this bifurcation that is happening in the underlying physics where as you get more and more blast energy, the type of structures that emerge change. And it's these types of complexities that are gonna be really challenging to capture um, without representative data to train our, our model. And so we did two kinds of experiments within this multimodal or uh, generalization across parameters. And so for this experiment, um, we held out the second highest blast energy trained on the other six, and then tried to reconstruct this held out seventh. And you'll notice the shred model does a pretty good job um, of reconstructing these temperature fields. Um, it does blur the dynamics a lot. This is an actively an active area of research. Um, but you can see it even it even kind of, even though it's not the correct structure necessarily, it does see that there is a double curl um, that's forming at the top. Um, However, when we hold out, for example, the second lowest blast energy simulation, um, 
it really doesn't do well at all. <laughs> it, it generally gets that like there is something evolving over time, um, but it, it doesn't get kind of this um, curl that's forming um, pretty tall. It totally does not capture that there's like multiple curls that are, are forming over time. Um, and so what this tells us is we just need more representative data of what could happen across um, parameters. And I think one of the, the ways we can do that is just generating a lot more simulation data. Hopefully that synthetic data will allow us to have kind of this surrogate example of like how our dynamics change over time. So getting to kind of this um, moonshot goal of reconstructing multimodal fields. Um, what we're doing is wanting to reconstruct the temperature and gas concentration and pressure um, simultaneously. This is the current state of the project. We have not solved this, um, and it's going to take a lot more computational effort to get there. But I wanted to bring this up because I think talking through the um, dis the the research process is really interesting. And so one of the things that we're running into, not only that we don't have enough data, but as we start getting into these higher data regimes, there's a lot of scaling issues when we're training these models. Um, we're not Google. We don't have a ton of GPUs and, and the memory that comes along with that. And so we kind of had to think a little bit smarter about how we were going to utilize our computational space. And some of you may have already kind of intuited this, but instead of using our shred model to map to um, the full state space, what if we just mapped to the low rank time dynamics? And, and instead of having our LSTM um, learning, or our LSTM is doing the exact same thing that it was doing before. Um, that doesn't change. But now what the low rank reconstruction is doing um, with our uh, shallow decoder network is it's learning the outputs of our LSTM and mapping to the low rank time dynamics. And then what we can do um, is if we want to access the full rank or the full state space, we can project back up into um, the full state space based off of our low rank dynamics that we found. And so the way that you would do the finding the low rank space is something like a singular value decomposition, PCA, that type of vectorization. Um, what's problematic about this is um, choosing the correct factorization paradigm has big implications depending on behavior of your system. So for example, um, the SVD is usually a really solid bulletproof choice um, for finding a low rank sub subspace, but it's, it's really good, for example, for periodic dynamics. These, um, these processes that are this one-way process, it's time variant, um, the SVD is not cutting it. And so there's other bases that we might have to project into um, such as the Fourier space or um, other more representative spaces that kind of capture this transience in time um, as the, the dynamics evolve. So this is where we're at with this project. Um, I would love to be able to have um, a great example of, yes, we've solved this problem. Um, but research is research for a reason, right? So we'll leave that there. What I want to spend kind of a lot of time, not a lot of time, the next 10, 15 minutes talking about is human motion tracking. So um, as Nicoletta mentioned, my PhD was actually here at UW in the mechanical engineering department. Um, and I used machine learning methods to study and understand and enable um, human mobility. So a lot of what I looked at is how we can measure and make models of things like the human musculoskeletal system and how brain injuries impact the function of the musculoskeletal system. And because of that, I spent a lot of time thinking about the type of data that we can collect about human movement, human movement, human motion. And this idea of motion tracking and analysis, it's really essential for monitoring things like disease progression, 
um, guiding rehabilitation treatment, and evaluating sports performance or informing assistive device design. It's really important and it's really difficult. Um, so biomechanists spend a lot of time collecting this data over a variety of different environments. And these different environments, whether in a lab like this that's here on campus or out in the wild, um, it's really gonna dictate which sensors that you can use and therefore what data you can collect. So for example, um, a lot of important biomarkers of health can be measured with technologies that are available in these precise state-of-the-art laboratory settings. So for example, um, biomechanists typically characterize motion um, such as walking or gait um, using biomechanical variables like joint kinematics, which is your joint angles or the relative angles of your different body segments over time. And you can measure things like kinetics, which is the different forces that are produced um, during those movements or spatial temporal parameters like step width, step length, that kind of thing. A lot of these um, things you can measure have been connected to meaningful um, biomarkers that are correlated to um, health outcomes. For example, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm on my second ACL injury and there is a biomarker, it's your knee adduction angle. And that biomarker is correlated and indicates, um, or you can monitor it to uh, look at things like ACL injury or, or risk of injury. Um, things like step width variability or the toe clearance when you're walking has been established as a biomarker for fall risk, for example, in clinical populations or aging populations. But life isn't lived in a clinic. And so we have more portable devices that allow us to get more out of lab um, motion tracking or movement monitoring. So for example, Smartwatches like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, or even uh, smartphones, they have IMUs, inertial measurement units. And these sensors monitor um, movement and typically are a little bit um, more limited in what they can measure or capture. And that makes sense. You're not gonna be able to quantify the same state of human motion in a precise laboratory as you are with uh, a smartwatch. But these portable devices show immense promise for allowing people to monitor things out in a more natural environment. But you have to be able to connect this data and contextualize it to meaningful biomarkers um, in order for you to have any sort of um, promise in giving insight to monitoring, diagnosing, or treating kind of these mobility-related health outcomes. And so my moonshot goal for this is to be able to use our shred modeling for this idea of data expansion to improve our accuracy and availability of these biomarkers for human health and performance. So what do I mean by data expansion? We're going to go kind of go back to this um, demonstration. So we have the ability to measure or estimate metrics of interest in the wild. And we can measure comprehensive data sets in a, in a laboratory setting. My hope and hypothesis is that we can learn a mapping from this sparse set of data to a more comprehensive set of human measurements such that um, with this expanded data set, maybe we can um, improve the accuracy and availability of monitoring biomarkers agnostic to our environment. So the first and probably most a uh, simple data set that we were able to um, able to evaluate was a collection of marker-based data quantifying the joint kinematics, so the joint angles over time, of adults walking on a treadmill. So you can imagine that's a very rhythmic, very periodic um, task. And so we trained our shred model to reconstruct the 18 um, marker-based uh, measurements or trajectories from either one or three, one or three um, sensor trajectories. So for example, when we just used the one dynamic trajectory, it was on the ankle versus the three were the hip, knee, and ankle. Um, and that's, um, was compared to not only shred, 
but we also wanted to see how well that compared to something like just a shallow decoder network. So shred without the LSTM um, and just a linear model to see how, how well that would do. And there's a lot to unpack here, but I want you to focus on the magnitude of the y-axis across these plots. And what you see is the scale is vastly different for the reconstruction error of, of our um, model performance um, across all of our kinematic variables along the x-axis. And then obviously the bo box plots are our statistical distributions of the 12 subjects that we looked at. Um, it's important to note that we trained shred models or all of the models, I guess, for an individual by individual basis. So these are not population-based models. Um, what we can look at though, is digging into kind of like the waveforms themselves. So the first thing I want you to see is that these waveforms, these trajectories look very periodic. There's not a ton of variability from period to period. That gives a very good gut check as to how well something like shred could potentially learn, um, learn these dynamics. I'm only showing six of the 18 trajectories that we reconstructed, but this is basically a good gut check of if it's not gonna work on the simplest example, it's not gonna work on more complex examples. So um, a slightly more difficult problem then is to do this population-based modeling. So again, a one subject holdout. So we're training our shred model on 11 of the 12 subjects data, um, either using a single or three um, sensor trajectories to then reconstruct all 18. And then we're gonna plug in the held out subjects sparse sensor set and see how well that their full set of, of kinematics are reconstructed. And it, again, shred in the blue does pretty well. Um, none of them do poorly except for the linear model. And I think that that makes sense. That's a good gut check that a shallow decoder network can capture a lot of the complexities of what's going on. It is a pretty easy task, um, but shred does pretty well. So we wanted to up the ante a little bit and we wanted to see if we could reconstruct reconstruct the IMU signals at the chest, the pelvis, and the ankles from an IMU pair on the wrists, such as like a smartwatch. So um, the IMU can measure and monitor things like acceleration, orientation, angular rates, and gravitational forces of the body segments that they're attached to. Um, and we're just reconstructing the accelerations, um, the linear accelerations. Um, in the X, Y, and Z direction. So those are, the, those are the signals that we're working with. The data were collected from 10 adults, again, walking on a treadmill. And we used violin plots to, to better visualize the distributions of our error. But again, you can see the shred model compared to the shallow decoder network or the linear model did really well um, comparatively. And this is a very simplified, I think, uh, visualization of of the error. This is a culmination of all of the subjects uh, across all of the signals we reconstructed. Um, but I think it, it shows um, a good overview of performance. Again, we, we performed for a population-based um, model, a one subject holdout, but this time we did a one subject holdout for every permutation. So for example, the first subject is held out and a tread model is trained on the next nine. And we did that for every single person. So each person had their own reconstruction um, for their population-based model, if that makes sense. Um, again, Shred's reconstruction error is very low, which is really promising for this idea of utilizing these more stereotypical or off the shelf um, portable sensors. Um, one of my uh, PhD student collaborators who's sitting in the audience is doing a deep dive on other things that matter when it comes to more of these IMU based um, signals with Shred. So things like, which sensors had the highest or lowest reconstruction error, or do the sensor locations matter, that kind of thing. These are just a, an example of a lot of different types of data we could potentially work with um, and how SHRED 
does on that. So there are a couple data sets that um, we evaluated there that are much more exploratory. Um, I'm not gonna go into the results of this, but I wanted to bring them up because they're very interesting and led to some more rabbit holes that I'm currently in. Um, so how many of you are familiar with the Monty Python Ministry of Silly Walks? Yeah. So imagine someone did a um, experimental data collection where they asked you to walk on a treadmill and come up with as many potential silly walks that you could come up with. That's what this what this data set was. And so um, this data set was actually originally used to understand if people could voluntarily modulate the complexity of their motor control. Um, but it provided a really interesting exploratory data set of someone maybe exploring their more biomechanical space that they could potentially walk in, not just your stereotypical walking pattern. We also evaluated um, a benchmark data set that's um, really common for computer vision tasks, especially in the computer science um, uh, space. What is very obvious about this is they were not collected by biomechanists. Um, and so this provided a lot of interesting data, but not a lot of um, representative data. And what I mean by that is, um, the few people who were asked to do these tasks were doing things like walking, acting, and freestyle dancing. Um, what was interesting, though, when you dig into this data is people are very animated with their arms and their upper body, but they tend to kind of just stay or sway with their lower extremities. And what I care about is the lower extremities. And so this didn't provide a ton of representative data for how someone might maybe navigate their their natural environment. What's important about this, though, is they're not on a treadmill. So it provides a lot more um, complexity in how people make turns, unpredictability in um, how your body coordinates. And they brought up this idea of complexity and the amount of data, representative data, or representative information your data set can give you. And so I tried to quantify this data using, um, for example, the SVD, so, or I guess it's PCA. So the first principal component quantifies how much variance is explained by that first um, principal component. And so here is a histogram of all of the variance explained by the first principal component of each of these data sets and their combinations. And what this is basically allowing us to do is say, on this end, this is considered the most complex set of tasks that this person was, was doing. That was the least complex. Can, now we can ask questions like, will a more complex set of data give us a better reconstruction accuracy with Shred than maybe a less complex um, data set? That's something we are, I am currently looking into. Um, and it's not as straightforward as you'd think. So with my last couple minutes, um, I want to give an example of a real world data set of a clinical population um, that we are, um, I'm currently navigating all of, all of this data, but it's important for a biomarker for predicting fall risk in people with multiple scler sclerosis. So this is hopefully the like, moonshot goal example of how we can go from a sparse set of data to the full comprehensive data set to then predict a meaningful biomarker. So folks at uh, the University of Vermont collected this really nice open source data set to understand fall risk and classify if someone would maybe at risk for falling or not um, if they had MS. And so this is a really interesting data set because it was a longitudinal, longitudinal study. So this was over two years. They um, visited for four in-lab sessions every six months, and they collected a ton of different tasks, both walking, sitting, standing, all these different things, um, with a really dense set of IMU sensors. And then following each lab visit, they gave um, two sensors at the um, shank and at the, or at the thigh and at the chest. And they said, we're gonna monitor your movement for 48 hours as you're just navigating your home, your community, your normal living environment. 
And this sounds like a prime example of how we can utilize Shred, where we have this comprehensive data set we collected in the lab, a controlled setting, and seeing how well or, or not this framework could allow us to monitor and reconstruct, expand our data um, in their free moving environment. And so our moonshot goal was to see if Shred would facilitate the improvement of classifying whether or not someone would be at more or less of a fault risk. Um, this is something I'm hoping to get out by the end of the quarter. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I have a couple takeaways that I'm hoping you guys got from this. The first is machine learning doesn't always have to be complicated, but having a theoretical rationale for the architecture can improve our interpretability and understanding of what we're trying to study. Your data matters and your model is only as good as the data that you have. And that application to real world, world problems is really difficult, but it's really important. So with that, I will take questions the last couple of minutes and thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much, Megan. That was great. It was a tour. So using this method, but uh, uh, using problems from many different fields, which was fascinating to see. Um, questions for Megan? Yeah. Um, this is a little telling on myself, but you mentioned that when the uh, um, six quality periodic problems can be a lot easier to solve. Is that uh, is there some kind of quality of the system that they need to analyze, or is it just the sample position you can like, get more information about the ideal triangle system? Um, it tends to be more so the <clears throat> that what you are learning is just kind of a generally a mean of the system. And then hopefully the model is then picking up on like potential seasonal changes or these um these other these other things that um kind of evolve, for example, in the sea surface temperature over many, many years. Um, generally this idea of non-stationary um, problems where the trend is generally changing um, over time or the mean is changing over time. That's that's a hard problem in general, not just like for dynamical systems. A lot of folks in other different types of modeling, like that's just generally a really hard problem. So yeah. 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 Yeah, so embedded in how this, the dynamic trajectory is like given to um, the model to be trained, the you do have to know the spatial like coordinates of your of your trajectory. Yeah, that is pretty important. Because that's gonna that's gonna end up telling us how our states and their neighbors are related to each other. Right? Yeah. We compare the results with other methods. Um, like in geoscience, we use creaking or mm -hmm. um, Gaussian models to interpolate variables that are pertain to this type of interpolation. Yeah. Um, and your sea surface temperature data set, I was wondering um, what was the time scale that you use? And I saw the ships like were navigating in parts that were not quite close to the equator, but yeah. still you got the equator kind of like, yeah. so that was kind of interesting to see. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I guess I asked you questions in one yeah. convoluted No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think the, I'll answer your second question first, which I think is like, what was the time scale over mm -hmm. which I was collecting data? So I tried to make up what a reasonable shipping route amount of time would be. So for example, I think LA to, uh, or LA to Singapore was like three weeks. And so because I knew that each snapshot was like one week at a time, I was trying to time it in a reasonable window where it was like going back and forth kind of like in this kind of three week period. Mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to make that as, as like real world grounded as possible. Definitely made a lot of assumptions on that. 
Um, with respect to comparing to other methods, um, this is actually a really interesting result from the original shred paper with immobile sensors. They did a pretty comprehensive um, comparison to different types of um, state estimation uh, method algorithms, but th they didn't compare to things like Gaussian process mm -hmm. regression or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So for the most part, from what I understand, this is one of the lower ends of reconstruction error. Mm -hmm. But that's state estimation. That's not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Gaussian process. OK. Yeah. I don't know cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> to learn more as yes. we progress with your research. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Megan. Yeah, of course. Um, other questions? Yeah. yeah. I am not sure how well it would do at kind of filling in the sparse data itself. It does really well, like Shred is going to do really well if you have the full data set to begin with. And then you can, for example, use the sparse measurements later. So for example, take earthquakes. There's a lot of different, you know, satellite imaging of earthquakes that have happened over many, many years. Imagine taking a lot of that geospatial data, learning a shred model of a lot of these different types of, of earthquakes, and then maybe the next time an earthquake happens, can we really quickly deploy or monitor that and maybe understand what's happening? Um, maybe forecast, you know, that kind of thing. It's not necessarily going to do a great job if it doesn't already have representative data to begin with. So I think sticking with more of the, like Gaussian process to fill in the sparse data, that that's a great way to like create surrogate data for then shred to hopefully use. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. All right, cool. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll see you next time.